Okay, we are recording. All right, I'd like to call this meeting of the North Valley Municipal Advisory Council to order and lead the group in the Pledge of Allegiance, which I believe will be on Ariel's, the flag should be on Ariel's screen, I think. Yes, um, give me one second to pull it up. So while, while you're doing that, I just want to say, um, you know, it's, it's been a tough month for, for people in this area, and, um, and I appreciate people being here for the meeting, and I, hopefully, um, you know, the presentations we have from the county are going to be very timely right now. So um, I know a number of us evacuated. There we go. All right, join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, to the public. For, which, Republic for which it stands, <clears throat> indivisible, one nation, under God, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, are we good? And now I'd like to ask uh, Vice Chair Das to call the roll. Vice Chair Das, are you there? You have to unmute. I'm sorry, I was on mute. The international language we now know, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Chair Dawson? Here. Council Member Handron? Here. Council Member Eagles? Here. Council Member, member Nardo Morgan? Council Member Cooper? I can see you, Jed, so I know you're here. Here. Thank you, Jed. Uh, Council Member Newhauser? Here. Council Member Dickey? Council Member Dowling, excused? And Council Vice Chair Doss, here. All right, thank you, Vice Chair Das. Um, just a few um, uh, housekeeping announcements at the beginning here, um, and welcome everybody to the North Valley uh, Municipal Advisory Council. Um, is there, um, Ariel, do you know, are there any uh, members of the public present right now? There are, there is, I think it's the same mystery phone person, and then um, our two presenters, and then two members of the public. Okay, great. Well, welcome to the presenters and the members of the public. And um, so just a few housekeeping notes. Um, question and answer and chat are turned off for the meeting. Um, when the public comment is open, please use the raise the hand function on Zoom and to be recognized and promoted to speak. And I'm going to turn that over to Ariel mostly because I, I am on limited, uh, a limited Zoom function right now. Um, if at any time it appears that the meeting has been hacked, we'll immediately terminate the meeting and reschedule at a future date. Um, and also want to remind fellow commissioners to get your oath of office and ethics Ooh. certificate to Ariel. Um, there's a, a few missing still. So, um, uh, and that was, was an interesting process to go through the whole uh, ethics certification, I thought. And, um, kind of gave me some interesting insights into uh, all levels of politics and what people should be and maybe shouldn't be doing. Anyway, that's that sort of as a comment. Um, I'd like to introduce our new minute taker, uh, Christina Schmuel. Um, Christina, if you just want to say hi. Hi, how are you guys? Hi, Christina. Welcome. Thanks, Thanks for being here. And, um, and just as a, an overview and a reminder, um, so the uh, Municipal Advisory Council um, is an advisory body to the county and specifically to our supervisor, uh, Susan Gorin. And we have um, specific advisory topics that we're uh, tasked with addressing. And just in brief, those include uh, transportation, uh, health and safety issues, um, including uh, housing and homelessness, uh, community projects like uh, art uh, and um, cleanups and, and uh, planting, things like that. And also uh, fire and community preparedness. 
And then if the supervisor decides she wants um, advisory discussion on other issues, she, she will tell us and we will address those. But for the, basically that's the, that's the uh, format that we're working within. Um, and just another reminder as far as um, when we're, we're getting in, some, some parts of this agenda um, are gonna be more of an open discussion and some parts will just be informational. And uh, the public is, will be invited to uh, make comments on, on anything that they care to, um, if it's not on the agenda. Um, and at some points, I may um, request that people, that if, if a discussion starts uh, on something that's not on the agenda, then I, I may ask people to stop, because uh, we're supposed to stick with, uh, as part of the Brown Act, we have to stick with what's on the, the agenda for discussion among council members. Um, so I think that's that's it for my introduction. Um, uh, Vice Chair Doss, do you have anything you want to add to that? Or nope, oh, I can't hear you. No, sir. Okay, great, thanks. So, um, does anyone have any corrections or additions to the minutes? And yeah, please raise your hand if you do. I don't have gallery view, so I, I can't, uh, I guess I can look at the participants. Mark, uh, Mark, uh, Council Member Newhouser um, raised his hand. Yeah, um, I recognize Council Member Newhouser. No, thank you. Uh, I had a uh, rather uh, disjointed uh, message in the last meeting, and I just wanted to clarify that uh, what I was trying to promote as a future agenda item is house hardening. And the word hardening was left out of the minutes from the last meeting. And um, I would like to also say that feel free to edit out uh, the extraneous <laughs> uh, words um, that are less than uh, comprehensible in the future. You don't have to record everything verbatim. Thank, thank you, Mark. Um, so that is a, that was our previous minute taker. She is no longer here and she tried so hard and I did not have the time to clean them all up, but um, Christina and I have had a conversation about that, but I will make sure that the word hardening, um, I'm going to make the adjustments to those minutes since she's yeah. not here anymore. Um, and I will make sure to add that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Council Member Newhouser and, and, uh, Ariel, and um, and we look forward to um, getting the next copy of the minutes. And and um, and as I think Ariel and I talked about, um, yeah, as as and as Mark as you said, sorry, as Councilmember Newhouser as you said, um, it doesn't have to be verbatim. It's if as long as we capture the the gist of what people are saying. Um, so, uh, does anyone would anyone like to make a motion to um, approve the minutes from the last meeting? Motion to approve, subject to the. Changes uh, by Councilman Newhouser. Anyone like to second the motion? Second. second. I'll second. Do we have one? Okay. All in favor of the motion to approve the minutes with the addition of um, Councilmember Newhouser's comments, uh, say aye. 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 All opposed? All right. The approval of the minutes is passed. So now we're gonna move on to the uh, public comment section. This is limited to items not appearing on the agenda. Um, so I'll ask for a, speak of, a show of hands for anyone from the public that wishes to speak on matters not on the agenda. And I think initially I'll limit those comments to three minutes um, and we'll see how that goes. Um, and I'm gonna let uh, Ariel um, call on people who've, who've raised their hands and, and give them the opportunity to speak. I am not seeing any raised hands in the attendees. Okay, um, and then we'll move on to introductions by council members. Um, we're gonna do um, brief introductions. Uh, we'll each personally introduce ourselves. Um, and you know who we are, uh, why we volunteered, um, 
So I'll, I'll start out. Um, I'm Arthur Dawson. I'm the chair of the, the MAC, as we call it, the Municipal Advisory Council. And I've lived in Glen Ellen for uh, over 30 years. Uh, raised two kids here. Um, my kids have gone to both Dunbar and Kennewood School. Uh, I worked for the Snowy Ecology Center for years. I've uh, been very involved with the local community, was involved with the forum. And um, the, really the, the overarching reason that I wanted to be on the MAC was because um, this community that I've grown to love, um, there's, there's a lot of forces that are working right now that may well change the community. Um, some may be for the better and that, that'll be welcome, but I just see a lot of big forces out there uh, for everything from um, the uh, SDC transition to uh, the increasing wildfires that we're experiencing. Um, so I felt it was important that the community have a voice with the county. Um, and so this is the closest thing that we can have, I think, to a, a, a town council for this part of the valley. And so I think it's really valuable to have this kind of a, a place to um, to speak. And then the, since we are actually part of the county government, the county will um, need to listen to us at some level. So I appreciate that opportunity. All right, who'd like to go next? Well, I'll go next. Okay. And my, na my name is Damon Doss. I live in Kenwood. I've lived here over 30 years. Uh, my kids went to school at Kenwood Elementary and then on into the Santa Rosa school system. I'm not gainfully employed. I'm retired and glad of it. <laughs> but, I'm, but I keep busy in various uh, activities and um, I'm very much interested in seeing what the MAC will be able to do specifically around housing and safety issues, also traffic issues, and, um, and whatever else that becomes before um, our group. Um, I'm with the Kenwood Fire Protection District. I'm on their board. Uh, I am a member of the uh, Valley of the Moon Rotary Club in Oakmont. And um, I go to the uh, Kenwood Community Church, uh, a little community church here in Kenwood for the last I don't know, 23, 24 years. Um, so um, pretty ingrained in the, uh, in the community. Thank you. All right, thank you, Council Vice Chair Das. And who'd like to be next? I'll go next. Uh, my name is Vicki Handron. I live in Glen Ellen, just south of um, the SDC, behind the apartments. I've lived here for, well, I grew up in Sonoma Valley, but I have lived in Glen Ellen for about 20 years and uh, raised three kids that have all gone through the local schools. And I am, um, I'm an attorney. I have a private practice, but I also work for a nonprofit in Sonoma called Sonoma Immigrant Services. It's a relatively new nonprofit that um, deals a lot with the immigrant community. And, and that's an area that I'm particularly interested in. And I am um, hoping that I will be able to um, bring a perspective um, for those who are typically underserved and um, hope, hopefully be able to be somewhat of a voice for, um, for people in our community who, who don't always get a lot of attention. All right, thank you, Council Member Handron, and, and uh, yeah, I'm really glad that you have that perspective and that you'll be able to, to share that with us and um, help us do some outreach to some folks who maybe are a little less, less well-connected. All right, who'd like to go next? I'll go next, Arthur. All right, Council Member sure. Newhouse. I'll, shall I say <laughs> Chair Dawson? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for uh, acknowledging. Um, yeah, I'm another 30-plus year veteran of the area um, in that same pool. I, I, I joined and or I asked to be a part of this because Arthur uh, suggested it and also because uh, Susan Gorin uh, had uh, suggested that I participate in some level. And so I really uh, enjoy the opportunity to participate, especially because um, I have a background both construction and in ecology and a lot of the issues that we're empowered to address uh, cross over between those two realms, particularly in the a fire safety 
issues. And um, I, I'm hoping and I'm passionate about bringing a balance to the emphasis on vegetation management versus house hardening. Um, because I think that the, not only did we witness um, the trauma of much loss to humans and their habitat, but also to nature. So I'm hoping to, um, uh, again, you know, promote a balance between how much vegetation removed and how much time we spend on making our homes fire safe. Um, I've also dealt with homeless issues, um, mostly from an environmental perspective of having to clean up encampments after they've been evacuated and having to witness the trauma, not only to the people, but to the environment. And um, I see, I saw firsthand uh, the misery and the in impacts uh, to not only the, on the social level, but an environmental level. And I think we can do a lot more to addressing that. Um, and uh, transportation, I've had to deal with transportation issues and making roads safer for both pedestrians as, as well as for vehicular traffic. So I'm pretty excited. I think we can do some things in town that will improve um, our mobility, our safety, and make it a more pedestrian and bicycle friendly environment. I could go on, but I won't. Thank you for the time. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Councilmember Newhouser, and appreciate your perspectives. And um, looking forward to working with you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Who's next? I can go, Arthur, if you want. This is Kate. Okay. Yeah, Councilmember Eagles. Oh, sorry, Councilmember Eagles. That is. Um, thank you all. And I and again, I'm on the phone, so I will say my name when I when I speak tonight because I have mysterious internet issues um, today. So my name is Kate Eagles and I live on the southern end of the boundary of this MAC in the area I call Rancho Madrone, so just south of Madrone <laughs> Road near Rancho Market. Um, and so I'm, I was very pleased as these boundaries were drawn with the MAC that, that, that my neighborhood was included here because I think um, that this is a diverse neighborhood without sort of a home and, and sort of, or, or a voice, I should say, or previously without a voice uh, to the county. So I'm, I'm really kind of pleased to be representing the full community of the back, but also my, my community here. I've lived here in this neighborhood for about 20 years. Like some of you all, I've raised two daughters um, uh, through the, the local schools. And I think uh, part of my motivation for becoming involved was I was always involved with the schools, you know, fundraising and, and doing various um, volunteer roles. And as they grew up, I thought, okay, well, how else can I stay involved with the community and how could I evolve that, you know, commitment to community? And, I th and so this seemed to be a really good way to do that. Um, as someone just mentioned, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I, I'm not on the phone, so it's a little harder for me to keep track of who's speaking. I mean, I'm not, on, I'm not on, in visual contact. But we just mentioned transport, transport, bike friendliness of the neighborhoods, uh, you know, safety. Um, my, my, also my, my sort of work history, I, I do um, work in recycling and, and data and measurement and recycled materials management. I have a lot of, I do a lot of work with boards and, and groups. Um, and where was I going with this? Um, 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 I can't remember, but anyway, that's what, that's what I do professionally. And so that has given me some, some relevant experience in this, in this realm. Um, um, and that's what I do here at home. And I guess that's pretty much it. Um, but I really look forward to serving in this role. Oh, I know where I was going with this. Previous to that, I did a lot of marketing. And so outreach and trying to get more voices heard is really something that, that's going to be important to me here. Um, and uh, so Arthur, uh, Council, uh, Chairman Dawson, take note because I, I would be interested in working on the outreach plan as we, we come to that on the agenda. So, so thanks all. Great, thank you Council Member Eagles and, and um, that's great that you wanna help out with the outreach plan. Um, look forward to all your uh, expertise coming into that, that effort. Um, how about, um, I'll, I'll just call on uh, um, Council Member Cooper. Sure, sure. I just had a neighbor drop by, so I was a little distracted. Um, Jed Cooper, I am a partner in an RIA firm in San Rafael. We've lived in Kenwood since 1980, and we raised five children. 
And I've been pretty involved in schools, both private and public. I've been on some boards of corporate co startup companies and things like that. I'm kind of a different sort maybe, but um, so I involved in schools, sports coaching, that kind of thing. But I've never really, since I've been here, been super involved in the community. I've always wanted to. And I think the fire of 2017, we lost our home. On, I live in Adobe Canyon just before you hit the squirrely part. We have horses, no grapes. And uh, I really haven't done anything, uh, I, I feel like, of substance for my, my community. So I just, my whole motivation is to just, just to get involved in the community, help out where I can and do what I can do. So I'm kind of, I guess, probably learning from you guys, but uh, I just want to jump in, get involved. Great. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Council Member Cooper, and appreciate your uh, stepping forward to make a contribution and look forward to working with you. And uh, by the way, I'm an alternative. I'm not, you know, full on, just so everybody knows. I don't know what that means exactly yet, but. Yeah, just um, I'll, I'll clarify a little bit for anyone that doesn't. That, um, so there's seven regular members and two alternatives. And, um, and actually, I'm not sure. Uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so the alternatives are, are there to step in if a regular member can't attend. Um, and I guess Melissa is the other alternative. So I guess there's, there's not an issue uh, at this meeting. But um, alternatives are, are uh, encouraged and welcome to share you know, thoughts and ideas and join in the full discussion. Uh, but when the, if there's a vote for anything, then alternatives are, can't vote. Um, unless they're filling space to somebody else, so. <laughs> well, and actually we don't have Angela. Um, oh, right. so, yeah. um, uh, uh, alternate Cooper, um, alternate, not alternative, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> That's um, you, you get to vote tonight, um, and, right. and, you know, instead of a, a council member uh, mooring in. Great, oh, thanks Ariel for clarifying that. Thank yeah. you. So enjoy the reins of power for tonight. Thank you, I feel better already, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, uh, Council Member Dickey. Uh, my name is Matthew Dickey. Um, I'm also a 30 year plus uh, resident of Glen Ellen. Uh, I've raised two daughters through the public school system. Um, I am a self unemployed general contractor. I've been a, uh, a project manager for Sonoma County. So I've been a Sonoma County employee also in my past. Um, I'm currently um, um, the Glen Ellen um, uh, person for the Sonoma Valley Citizens Advisory Commission. Um, so this meeting, I will report back to our meetings that happen once a month additionally. Um, I like what you said about a town council, Arthur. I think that's exactly why I was interested in participating. You know, I'm, I'm a believer in democracy, you know, and participation is really important in a democracy. Having your voices heard, the concerns of citizens should be um, managed by political people. And um, um, so that's largely why I'm participating. Um, I've been a coach locally, I've participated in the public schools, and we were raised as a family to participate in your local government as a volunteer, kind of like that. That way you're not uh, trapped in the, the vote gathering machine. And um, so I look forward to seeing what we do here. All right, thank you, Council Member Dickey, and, and appreciate you bringing all of your experience and, and your connection to the uh, Citizen, Citizens Advisory Council, which addresses issues that are a little bit outside our purview, but of high interest to people in this community. And I, um, uh, Chair Dawson, I just wanna say, since I know you can't see that um, alternate Dowling has joined us. And so okay. uh, if you would like to let her know what we're doing and um, ask her to participate. Sure. So um, Council Member Dowling, I, I'm on limited technology right now, so I can't see the gallery view. But um, anyway, we're uh, introducing ourselves. So if you want to say a few words about um, who you are, um, your history in the community, and, and what you're hoping 
uh, we can do with the Mac and what the Mac might accomplish. Um, you know, this is a this is your opportunity to do that. Um, okay, thank you, for Chairman Dawson and everyone. I, I apologize for being late. Um, my car battery died. When was the last time that happened? Just, it was uh, crazy, um, but but good excuse nonetheless. So um, I apologize and uh, thank you. Um, so I'm Melissa Dowling. I live here in Glen Ellen with my husband, Paul Gauguin. Um, he is an artist, but it's spelled a little bit different. Um, we moved here in 2000, end of, very end of 2013, early 2014. Um, I were semi-retired or were until we uh, just purchased the Kenwood Press. So it's starting the first of the year and actually already that will bring us uh, back to be employed, even if not necessarily gainfully. Um, but we're, we're really looking forward to that. Um, we, Paul has a daughter um, who lives in New York City and she's in publishing. Um, let's see, I, my background is in tech. I'm currently the president of the board of directors of the Glen Ellen Forum and we're actively recruiting for our transition to the board of directors, which will happen in April. And that's about it. I'm very looking forward to really getting to know people. In terms of the Mac, I just, I really value the ability for us to be um, ambassadors and representatives of our communities and really help the board of supervisors to, you know, understand um, more of what our small unincorporated area, you know, expects um, and hopes for from our local government. All right. Thank you, Council Member Dowling and, and glad to have you aboard and I'm really glad to have you taking over the Kenwood Press. That's a it's a very key role in the community and it's great that you're you've taken that on thank you that means a lot okay also, uh, uh, sorry chair dawson i also wanted to let you know that supervisor goran has joined um so okay. uh, uh supervisor um We have a great time at our staff meetings, uh, making fun of each other as we freeze uh, during the Zoom. It's part of the virtual world. So thank you all for uh, once again uh, volunteering to be part of the amazing North Valley Mac. And I'm so excited to be working with you. And I understand from Ariel, after you go through the introductions, you're gonna be talking about community preparedness and really important, Yes, no, that mountain behind me is not in flame, but this was taken after the fire, the most recent fire in a gorgeous sunset. So, and the air had cleared that night. So I, I've asked Ariel for the future Mac meetings to maybe give me about 10 minutes to, to give you an update on all things happening at the county and, uh, and elicit your questions. So carry on, thank you all for what you bring to the table especially now. All right, well, thank you, Supervisor Gorin, and, and I'm glad you could join us, and we'll look forward to seeing you at, at our next meeting, and we welcome your reports from the county, and thanks for all you do. Okay, um, let's see. So we're now gonna move on to the uh, evacuation and preparedness presentations. Um, and we have one of one of the uh, presenters had to uh, was busy because of the red flag warning this evening. But we have, I believe, we still have uh, Misty Wood, who's the community engagement liaison for the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office, and Nancy Brown, who's the community preparedness manager for the Sonoma County Department of Emergency Management. And um, and so they're going to speak, and then. Um, Let's see, just to let people know what the format is, um, when we have a presentation, then right after the presentation, there will be um, questions by council members, and then it moves into questions from the public, and then the presenter can respond if they want, and then, um, and then there's comments by council members, and if there's a resolution, which probably won't be one in this, this particular presentation, then we would take a vote. But um, so it's presenters, council members, public, Presenters, council members. I think I got that right. Okay, I'll let Ariel um, promote um, Misty Wood and Nancy Brown uh, so we can hear their presentation. I already promoted them, so they're they're here, yeah. and I think um, that they that uh, 
Misty's gonna go first and then Nancy's gonna follow her. Okay, you're welcome. All right, thank you very much. Um, Arthur, since you can't see us all, my name is Misty uh, with the Sheriff's Office here. Uh, my background originally was in environmental studies. I got my degree from Sonoma State in environmental studies with a minor in Spanish. And I worked as a land use planner for 13 years before joining law enforcement several years ago. So since I've joined the Sheriff's Office, I've worked the Glass Fire, Walbridge Fire, uh, Kincaid Fire, and Tubbs Fire, and I also went out as mutual aid to the Camp Fire. So I have far more experience in fire than I ever imagined, frankly, when I signed up for this job. Uh, so the good news and bad news of that is we've gotten pretty darn good at doing evacuations and everything associated with responding to a fire from the law enforcement side of things. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I manage our community outreach unit and on during fires, I co-lead our crisis communication teams. So we're sending out the Nixels and doing all of the social media and press conferences with the sheriff. So that's a really brief introduction about me. Diving right into evacuations, I'd like to start with the terminology and there are really two terms that this, this group should be familiar with. Evacuation warning and evacuation order. So an evacuation order, uh, warning is what we issue if there's time to sort of put you on notice that there might be an order coming up and that you potentially could be in danger. So what we recommend is that when you receive an evacuation warning, you make sure that you're ready to go. Your stuff is packed, you've contacted friends or family um, if you have those available to have a place to go and you're paying attention to your surroundings. We also recommend that if you are, if you have any sort of special needs, you can't drive at night, you're elderly or disabled, um, you have large animals, you have other conditions in your life that would require you to take a little bit of extra time. We recommend that you evacuate under that warning phase so you do have enough time um, to take care of yourself and your family and um, you know, people and pets that you might be responsible for. That second term evacuation order is mandatory. So this is what we issue. When we issue this, it means that your life is potentially in danger and it's time to go. So um, it's, it's not optional, it's, the, it's time, to, time to get going. And so this is what we issue. Um, typically we issue that right away at the beginning of a fire because it's just starting. And uh, if, we have, if we have time, we'll issue that warning first, but it just depends on the nature of the incident. So keeping those two things in mind, my next recommendation for everybody is to go on to socoemergency.org and look at the fire incident map and look up your evacuation zone. So when we do evacuations, you guys are probably familiar with something like zone 6A1. What does that mean? Uh, we issue evacuation orders by zone and we also let you back home and back to your properties, generally speaking, by zone. So what we found is it's a very efficient way on our end and operationally with firefighters to figure out which areas to evacuate, kind of quickly call them. And it's a good way for the public to understand whether or not you have to evacuate. Kind of the last thing that we want our community to do is say, do I evacuate? Do I not? Do I have to? That kind of indecision and confusion it is not what we're wanting um, for our people because it's already stressful enough when something's happening. So when you go to socoemergency.org and you look at the map, you can type your address in at the top left-hand corner and go right to the zone. So whatever zone you are, you know when you're getting an evacuation notice, if you see something like you know 6D2 or whatever your zone is, you know that it's time for you to evacuate or uh, be on warning depending on the situation. When it comes to notifications of letting you know there is an order, the county is in charge of the alert and warning program. Department of Emergency Management uh, manages that program. But the Sheriff's Office also steps in and helps because we know it's a team effort to keep you safe. We work really well with our partners at emergency management. And the reality is when there's an evacuation going on, we're the first ones there because we're already on duty and we're the ones who are helping you get out. So there are a few tools that we use to support the county's effort in letting you know about an evacuation. One of those is called the Hilo Siren. <clears throat> and I'm just gonna play a short clip for you guys. So in case you haven't heard it, you're able to, this might be your first time. Um, so that is that distinctive two-tone siren is what we use only during an evacuation. 
So fire, um, fire apparatus have it, law enforcement vehicles have it here in the county, and it's one way that you can know that there, um, that there is an evacuation for, you know, for your neighborhood. We also have deputies who are out there, so we call them boots on the ground. There are deputies who are going door to door, knocking on your door, and making announcements over their PA system that there's an evacuation order, so you may hear about that way. Uh, we also use Nixel. That's probably our most well-known tool <laughs> that everybody's heard about. We have 350,000 people subscribed to Nixel. So we, um, the good news with that is we, we are rapidly able to reach a lot of people. Um, you do have to be signed up for it. So it's important to make sure that as you're doing your preparedness and talking with your community members to sign up for Nixel at nixle.com, N-I-X-L-E.com and also share that with your neighbors in your network as people are talking about emergency preparedness. We do send out Nixels bilingual, English and Spanish. So um, if you're signed up for Nixel in Spanish, you'll get a Spanish language alert from us. And if you're just signed up for Nixel, you'll get an English as your, as your default setting. We also geotarget Nixels. So um, rather than every time there's a Nix, every time there's something happening that requires a Nixel like an evacuation order, rather than sending out a, a, you know, a text message to 350,000 people, we're targeting our message to the people who are affected. And, and we really do that in a way, there are two reasons. One, we really wanna make sure we're reaching the people who really have to know about this particular order. And the second part of that is we don't want people to unsubscribe to Nixle. So we've sort of, we're constantly fine tuning how we use it. And we've, we've definitely made a, a number of modifications in how we use it since the Tubbs fire. Um, but that's one, balance that we're always trying to achieve amongst 350,000 subscribers is when and how do we send Nixels to the people who really need to, to receive them? And, you know, how do we not over Nixel or burden people who don't need it or don't want it um, and, you know, discourage them from reading their Nixels or, or, you know, canceling their subscription altogether because we don't want to run into that issue. Um, so since we're in a red flag warning too, I just wanted to share a couple of my tips that I usually share with groups that I meet with. Um, it's just timely given where we are right now about how to prepare for a red flag warning and you know possible evacuations. Uh, the first thing I recommend always, and this is what I do, is, is keep your gas in your car half full at least, and then park your car facing out so you can get out quickly if you have to. I recommend keeping your stuff packed and by, you know, in one location. So your go bag, prescriptions, things for pets and, and other people in your family, photos, everything that's important. It's a good idea to have it kind of packed and ready to go. And that way, if an evacuation order does come out, it's sort of quicker and easier to evacuate. Um, I recommend you keep your cell phones charged by your bed, even overnight, because as you're getting alerts, they're coming through on your cell phone most often. And it's not going to do you any good if your phone is downstairs charging in the kitchen when you're, you know, upstairs sleeping in bed. Uh, and then the last thing too that I recommend is maintaining situational awareness. So mm -hmm. this is just being surroundings, being aware of, you know, if a fire starts nearby, kind of where is it, you know, paying attention to see if there's smoke outside and really looking at reliable resources. So I really emphasize the reliable part of that sentence when we're talking about reliable sources of information, because you've probably noticed, especially on social media, uh, you just never know what you're quite going to get on social media in particular. And so really finding places that give accurate and reliable information quickly is important. So the sheriff's office is on social media. You can certainly follow us. Um, some of the news stations have done a great job, like KSRO, for instance, has done a great job of reporting really timely and accurate information as well. So find out what works for you. And I, I think with that, I'll go ahead and wrap it up as far as my presentation side. I know that Nancy Brown with the county is going to present as well. And when we move into the questions section of this, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Misty. Hi, I'm Nancy Brown and I am the Community Preparedness Program Manager for Sonoma County. Um, a little background on me, I do have a PhD in Emergency Management, which I received in um, Wellington, New Zealand. Um, during my PhD work was the um, Kaikoura earthquake, which was a 7.6 earthquake that um, erupted off the coast of this, the north of the southern island and disrupted Wellington tremendously. So I had a lot of really great research 
capability during that PhD to um, research people that were in the middle of a recovery from a major earthquake, which um, I think was, was really valuable to me, unfortunately or fortunately. Mm, how do you say that? We haven't had a major earthquake here, so, so that, that is not as valuable for this group. But we do have, of course, lots and lots of other things that we're working on all the time in the county. And um, I came to the county uh, June of last year. So since I've been here, we had the um, power shutoffs of last year, uh, the Kincaid fire, um, the pandemic. And then of course, now we have um, just gotten over two other fires. So lots of things going on in the county. And one of the things I have to just say about the county in general is, um, nobody will find any community that is more open to and more aware of how important emergency preparedness is. This county really understands the difference between preparedness and not being prepared and how valuable that is. And they're very open to hearing and understanding all of the different messages, which is super wonderful because a lot of communities that don't have emergencies going on, it's really hard to get that message to people that someday something might happen to you, so you should have these things ready. But, but in Sonoma County, people really understand that, that this is, these are things that really can keep you safe, keep your loved ones safe, allow you to have minimal disruption when things happen. And so that's really, really important. Um, we're doing a lot of different things at the emergency management department in the preparedness realm. And I want to just touch on a few of those for you today. And the first one is, and you can find it at SoCo Emergency on the Get Ready page, we've developed a bunch of these evacuation timelines. And what they are for you is that they give you an opportunity to look at these and say, okay, if I have to leave immediately, here's what I'm going to take. If I have an hour before I have to leave, here's what I'm going to take. If I have more than an hour, here's some other things I'm going to take. And we've broken these down into a number of different checklists. So we've got them in great big print, and you can just print them right from your um, internet service. Um, and, and this gives you a chance to really start thinking about if you do need to evacuate, what's your plan look like? And start to really formalize that in your head. The best time to do those things is before you need to evacuate. We all know what it's like when somebody tells us, go now. It's um, more likely that we're going to grab something that's not as important to us and leave something that's very important to us if we're moving in a hurry. But if we've taken some time in advance to sit down with everybody who lives in our household and talk about what things are really important to us and what things we're definitely gonna take if we need to go, and if we have a little more time, what other things we might add to that, then, then we have this opportunity to, to kind of practice that and get ready to do that so that when we do get an order from the sheriff that says, you guys need to leave now, or we're getting a warning that we can start gathering those things that are important to us because we've already thought about it in advance. The other thing that we're doing that we have, um, we're working on, and they're actually at the printer right now, these are called evac packs. And what this is, is it has a little hole at the top so you can hang it from the inside closet door or um, inside your kitchen cabinet, somewhere where you can see it all the time. And inside here, this has our emergency um, preparedness plan. It also has those checklists I just showed you before, information about power outages, and anything else you wanna slip in here. If you wanna slip in your insurance document or a thumb drive or things like that. And you can hang these somewhere very convenient for you. Um, the sheriff is also working on some evacuation ribbons. We envision you could also put some of those in here too. So this is a place where you can just simply slap it right on a place that's easy for you to get to, where it's not gonna get lost in the kitchen drawer or something like that. And these are at the printer right now. Um, we're gonna have these available to start distributing um, within the next week or so. And I'm really excited about this because this gives people a great opportunity to, if they haven't started doing any planning yet, if they haven't really thought about things like what they're gonna take in their evacuation order or things like that, this gives you an opportunity to just have, have this whole kit ready to just sit down and just take care of it now. So it puts it all in one place for you. You don't have to go download anything. Um, we do have these in English and in Spanish coming off the printers in the next few weeks. So very excited about those. Um, I'd like to kind of reiterate something that Misty said that I think is really important, and that is we are in a red flag warning right now. And one of the things about a red flag warning, and I, I talked to a couple of you a few weeks ago when we had the fire as well as the red flag warning. And, and the thing that we want to remember about this red flag warning is this is our opportunity to get that leg up. That if there's a red flag warning, that means there's not that there is a fire or that there's going to be a fire, but that the conditions are right for a fire. So, so that's our opportunity to really just make sure our go bag has what it's supposed to have in it and it's somewhere we can easily get it. 
um, make sure that we have all of the plans that we have made, that they're still ready. If it's been a while since we've looked at our things, make sure they're still ready. And as Misty said, get our car out of the garage and get it ready to go. Make sure there's gas in it. This gives us this opportunity to really just take that extra couple of hours well in advance to just with a cool head, look at our situation and say, here's where we are. What do we need to do if we need to go? If there is a fire, what do we need to do? So I really hope that everybody recognizes what um, a great warning device that red flag warning is because it gives us time well before anything's happened to with a very cool head really think about what these plans might look like for our families. And I think especially as Missy also said, really important for, for some of our, our disabled friends, um, senior citizens that may not drive any longer, those types of people, that that red flag warning, if it's my mother, that's my warning as her daughter to know I need to go get her now because I don't need to go get her in the middle of a fire. I need to go get her now and bring her to my home. That this is what we're gonna do now. We're gonna go get mom and bring her here or whatever those plans are that you have that you know, if you waste a little bit of time, if you disrupt your life for a few hours and there's nothing happened, then I think we're all going to be feel pretty happy about that. There was no fire, nothing happened. We got to waste time doing something in advance. And I think that's a great thing. We'd love to waste our time getting prepared and have nothing happen. So I hope that um, you can all think about how, um, how you can just really just get a leg up on it. And the thing is, and particularly if you're looking at it as a, as a community, Every single thing you do in advance empowers you to limit the disruption of whatever is coming next. This is a very empowering thing to do. When you get your go bag ready, it feels like you're Superman because you did that. You checked that off your list. When you have two cases of water that you unload from your car and put in your garage, that feels really good. It really feels like you're doing something. You're taking that feeling that we get this time of year where we're kind of at a loss and there's nothing we can do about it. And you're taking it back. And you're actually turning that into a, an empowering moment for yourself and for your community that you empower to do those types of things because you are saying there is things I can do. And I'm not at a loss. There's not nothing I can do about this. There's a whole list of things. We have a whole list of things here in this list and that list. So there's all kinds of things that I can do to make sure that everything I can do in advance I've done. And if a disruption does occur, if a fire does occur, if an earthquake does occur, whatever it is, that you've already taken all of those steps to try to ensure the family safety. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, so I'll open up uh, to any questions from council members, either for um, Nancy Brown or Misty Wood. All right, Arthur, Arthur can't see you guys. Um, so we have um, Council Member Cooper and then Council Member Dowling are the hands that I saw. Yeah, my, my question is to Nancy. Um, just curious, how do you get the kind of water to the ed, end of the row, so to speak? Uh, the information you just gave was very, very good, both of you. How do I, I speaking for this most recent incident in Adobe Canyon Road, I don't think anybody really knew about much of this. Uh, I stayed along with about two other neighbors and uh, people asking questions that you've both really answered quite well. So I'm just, I'm just new around this issue. What do you, how do you get, how do you get this information out? What's and that's a really, really great question. I think one of the things that's important here is community groups. And I know in areas where we have very active cope groups and very active um, map your neighborhood groups and those kinds of things, they really help spread that message through the community and also look after each other when there's an emergency or an evacuation in terms of those types of things. So, so one of the things we're trying to do is to try to find ways to, to engage community leaders to help us start start some of those different community groups. And I know at the, the Springs MAC, they're looking at some of the different ways that they can start to foster leadership in starting some of these different groups. And, and I think certainly in, in your area as well, anything we can do to help you kind of start looking at how to create some neighborhood groups around these things, that really helps move that bar tremendously. We also, of course, use social media um, and, and all of those other tools but there, there is no substitute for, for word of mouth and neighbors talking to neighbors about how to, how to get things done and get prepared and get ready. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, I, I don't know, um, I know in Glen Ellen here, there's uh, there are neighborhood captains for certain neighborhoods. 
I'm not sure. It, one thing I thought of is, is does the county have any um, like overall map of where those groups exist or a, a list? Maybe Ariel can answer or maybe you can answer. Um, Anybody I don't know? think there's an official list. Um, I have a list of a few things. So I do have some some of the some of your block captains' names on a list. I also have um, some Northern Sonoma County Cove groups and some fire safe groups down in the the Mayacama area. And so I have probably 150 maybe different um, groups that I'm familiar with already um, uh -huh. that do exist. And I think our county is very diverse in the types of preparedness groups we have also. So we have the the citizens organized to prepare for emergencies or the COPE groups. We also have the fire safe councils. We have the map your neighborhood groups and then we have the block captain groups as well. So we have we have a pretty good diversity of different <clears throat> types of groups that are also available in the county to, to get involved in. And, and I'm happy to help support anybody who's looking to start a group in their neighborhood. All right, thanks Nancy. And I think we had um, a, a councilwoman Dowling and then uh, Vice Chair Doss who would like to All right. Thanks, Ariel. Uh, so uh, just a quick question. Um, the evac packs look extremely useful. That's a fantastic idea. How, how will you be distributing those to people? Well, I'll be reaching out to my partners like Ariel for advice on that. And if you have, um, if you have a specific idea of where you'd like to distribute some, please reach out to me. I just need to know how many and whether you need them in English or Spanish. Great, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a number of opportunities for uh, local groups that we could, we could get those out to. And uh, maybe the MAC can help smooth the way. Um, Vice Chairman Das. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you both for your presentation. I do think we learn from our history and this evacuation uh, we learned again about uh, some of the problems we have. I'm speaking now of the Kenwood 12 corridor. We have about uh, 5,000 people live in Oakmont and another 5,000 in the hills around Kenwood and in Kenwood. And that evening, um, it was bumper to bumper, um, move ahead a step, step back, is wait, move ahead a step. <clears throat> And I noticed that in Kenwood, the village of Kenwood, we had maybe a half a dozen sheriff units helping us go door to door, making sure people were out. I'm not sure of the coordination between the sheriff's department and highway patrol, because we clearly need to keep the traffic moving out of, out of the area. And I recognize we can't turn both lanes into out because there were tons of fire trucks and other emergency personnel trying to get in to fight the fire, and thank goodness they did. But it's still an issue. Um, I don't know if the supervisor is still on or not. Has she left? And she must have left. I think she was quoted as saying it took her an hour and a half to get from her, wherever she was, to out of Highway 12 and to safety. And that's all. And I'm time. here. I'm here, Damon. And that was pretty typical for Oakmont. Um, um, part of Oakmont uh, were able to go north if they left early. And since I seem to have packed everything in my house because I didn't want to lose it again, it took me a while to finish packing and then get out and then creep uh, from my house, which is by the Quail Inn uh, along Pythian Road and down Kenwood. And by the time I got south of Kenwood and potentially Glen Ellen, traffic was free flowing pretty well. But it is, it is a challenge, uh, but I, I will say one of the philosophies that Misty might comment on is that we have learned from the campfire and certainly the tubs and the nuns fire. When we see fire emerging, Cal Fire whips out their maps, they plot the direction of the winds, and then immediately go to those locations and starting to evacuate folks. And we evacuate all of those folks early. So we had no fatalities in the, in the, um, the Wallbridge Fire, and you know we had large evacuations for that. 
and certainly the Kincaid fire, large evacuations. So they evacuated early. Uh, was a little concerning to me because of the pace of the fire was faster than I anticipated. And it took about an hour to go from the county line down to Highway 12. And, but yet they were on it. They evacuated everybody. They went door to door along Los Alamos Road and, uh, and Oakmont and to make sure that we didn't leave anybody behind. And, and with the high low si sirens also, and they did an excellent job of evacuating St. Helena uh, Road area, which was exceedingly complex because they evacuated the southern side of St. Helena Road first and those areas around Monin's Rill were evacuated an hour or two later by the time that the fire was then moving up Diamond Mountain. So I, I have great faith in uh, the Sheriff's Department and our firefighting organizations to now have a pretty good guess as to where the fire patterns are happening, the direction of the wind, the speed of the winds, and now having a number of successes of successfully evacuating people early and having traffic control absolutely in hand. We still need to get a handle on the Nixle alerts. We're trying to unscramble that and a SoCo alerts. And so I think we need uh, some more work on that. And there is a next generation of alert and warning system that we are investigating so I, I, I'm an eternal optimist. We will have better technology to help us. Now, if all of you would accept cell towers in your neighborhoods, <laughs> <laughs> just, just had to get that in there. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. Quick question for you though. Part of our responsibilities that have been assigned to the North Valley MAC is traffic issues, traffic comfort. And I think it's one of the questions that has to at least be asked. This is gonna be a hard one for me to even say, but I'm gonna say it anyway, cause people are talking about it in the Valley. There has been no support in the past for widening of 12 between Oakmont and Santa Rosa heading towards Melita Road because of beauty quite frankly, because of the beauty of the moment of the trees. But many of those trees are no longer, did not survive. And so will this group, North Valley Mac, be involved in a conversation regarding the future of widening of 12? Or is that something that's strictly a Caltrans issue? Yes and yes. Um, I've heard from a lot of my uh, constituents and neighbors in Oakmont. They wanted the trees gone. They wanted the roadway widening. And this is goes back a generation or more. Uh, it was the conversation about making Highway 12 four lanes uh, for the full extent was squelched up by a lot of folks. And maybe some of you on this call were part of that outcry. And I, I, I tried to suggest gently that we now have been evacuated a number of times very safely. And the uh, Sheriff's Department and the firefighters were absolutely responsive to our needs. But as we've gone up and down the corridor, we look at the devastation along Highway 12. Sadly, uh, those beautiful arching oak trees are being um, chopped and ground up and not all of them, we may have a few left, uh, but we also want to work on um, fitting in a multi-use path along there as I look at the upper reach and uh, the right away of um, where the trees are coming down, parallel Oakmont, I think, okay, that's where the multi-use path is going to be. So we have to fit that on. Caltrans did talk with me about six years ago of widening the shoulders from Madrone to Egg Farm Road, Kenwood. They felt that the number of accidents along there warranted a widening of the shoulders. And I had regional parks talking with them about at the same time, widening the road enough for a multi-use path because we've had some serious 
um, by cycling fatalities and injuries along there. I will not ride my bike on Highway 12, except in those areas that have. Um, and they were pricing it out. And I, we just met with Caltrans a couple of months ago and they said, um, was horror expensive to even widen the shoulders in that location. And so they, they abandoned that effort to widen the shoulders. And as, as you know, Caltrans moves glacially and you have to get them on a work plan and maybe a decade later it comes forward. And so I, I, I think we can engage with Caltrans. It's totally appropriate for the Mac to meet with Caltrans and at some point we'll invite TPW and Caltrans to come in and have this conversation. And I just want to warn you that um, they have so many priorities and so many demands, Sonoma Valley, if not other places, that it's, it's going to be challenging for them to wrap their heads around that. Um, but worthy of a conversation involving the sheriff and the fire agencies in that conversation, for sure. Thank you, Supervisor. I just, could, could I add something to just um, following up on the supervisor's comments about a little bit about the coordination and I appreciate you recognizing supervisor kind of what it takes to move people and as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Doss, it's a matter of you can't go, you can't just have traffic going out because first responders are coming in and of course the follow up conversation is potential road widening. It's a, it's a whole nother, um, kind of a whole nother piece of the conversation. So um, when we had this going on, we set up our incident command post at the Safeway on Calistoga Road. So that's essentially our mobile command post that all of the police officers reported to. If they weren't already in the field doing what they needed to do for evacuations, they reported there to get coordinated before they went out. So that's where you have deputies, CHP, Santa Rosa Police. Oh, we had Katati, we had, we had other you know, local agencies coming to help up. So that's where they report to first so that all of the coordination on the ground is happening. Um, so, you know, once we found out that the traffic was heading essentially all into Santa Rosa and the traffic jam was occurring, we started to put out messaging through social media, through our media partners, et cetera, to, you know, head the other way. You know, don't go towards Santa Rosa westbound, right? Head east on Highway 12 if you haven't gotten out yet. Letting people know as these issues come out, we're monitoring those as closely as possible and getting the word out as quickly as possible to try to look for alternate routes. Um, and then Supervisor Gordon, you had mentioned something about the Nixle alerts and I, all that I had heard was that the, the WIA alerts, the wireless emergency alerts from Napa County were a little bit problematic this time and that there was a lot of bleed over into Sonoma County. Um, so I, you know, my understanding is that our good, the good people at Department of Emergency Management were in close coordination with Napa and probably will continue to be to make sure that as the work with them as much as possible. Um, so during our next, you know, during our next disaster, whenever that is, Hopefully there isn't uh, the same level of uh, sort of bleed over from other counties unnecessarily. Thank you. I've heard from a number of folks in Kenwood that they did not receive Nixle alerts and indeed they are signed up. Oh, my screen just went, I'm in the dark here. <laughs> See if I can light me, light me up again. Um, and so it might be good for the MAC members to go around the room and say, did you receive a Nixle alert? Because it's patchy. Now, I, I was absolutely adamant that I did not receive a Nixel alert that night. And um, Cheryl did some investigation, said, oh, yes, someone picked up a phone at your house. I said, well, <laughs> fire brain, maybe, <laughs> evacuation brain. Um, but by that point, I was already packing and getting ready to evacuate. There was the difference between uh, the evacuation warnings in Oakmont and, and mandatory, war, uh, mandatory alerts, Oakmont and the areas just across the street from Oakmont because that was the direction of the fire coming down and thanking all Damon and all of his great uh, firefighters for standing the line and saying, we are not gonna let this fire go into Oakmont. And indeed that's pretty much what happened except for some ember cast over those three structures and much less vegetation along Highway 12 uh, that is climbable. So, but Oakmont will have to look uh, carefully and I'm already lobbying. 
they need to replace that those wood fences with something more resilient. Can't replace wood fences there anymore. Um, yeah, that's, that's an idea that I would like to explore at some point as alternatives to flammable fencing. Um, I, I'd like to, to go to the Nixel, uh, Nixel census, but before we do that, maybe we can, um, uh, Council Member Newhouser has had his hand up for quite a while, so if, um, if he'd like to, to speak yeah, for a minute, then we'll, then we'll check in about Nixel reception. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Dawson. Um, um, I've been typing away in the chat and then I realized, of course, it's turned off, right? Um, so no one probably saw my comments, but I'll, so I'll just read them since it helped me to collect my thoughts anyway. Um, I do have a couple comments and a couple questions for our uh, panelists. Um, uh, regarding the um, uh, distribution of these preparedness packets, um, uh, we do have neighborhood captains in areas, so the neighborhoods are pretty well represented. I think that would be a very good target uh, for dissemination. Um, I can personally distribute to, through our homeowners association here in Glen Ellen, uh, about 45 homeowners. So that's, that's a place to start too. So if you can identify associations, um, block or neighborhood captains, um, that could go a long way toward getting materials out there. Um, and then a comment regarding the highway, I think that's fascinating. And yes, I drove through the area and it was very sad to see so many of those heritage oaks cut up. And I start with a rhetorical question. Um, how long does it take to replace a 100 year old oak tree? Well, <laughs> we need to prepare for that eventuality. And it seems inevitable that even though this is a designated scenic highway, um, they'll probably have to widen it once it becomes unsafe or the traffic becomes uh, untenable. And, um, and if so, then uh, we, once the right of way is secured, we should start planting those young trees to, to replace the heritage oaks. And that's something that we can help with here, <clears throat> excuse me, as a part of the North Valley Mac. Um, so it could be a great community project, but it could also be a part of the planning process um, in dealing with the oak and the mitigation of the loss of so many heritage oaks. Um, and then let's see, let me finish up my notes here. Um, this is more directed toward um, Misty. Um, we got a lot of notifications uh, from Napa and it seems like they do not geographically target their notifications. And I was wondering if you're in communication with them and that or if they're willing or have been urged to change to more closely resemble the Sonoma protocol. I don't know if they're changing that or not. Um, I know that Sam Wallace, who's a uh, emergency, sorry, the alert and warning manager, I believe his title is over Department of Emergency Management, um, has been in close contact uh, with Napa County. Uh, I think they're the OES, Office of Emergency Services, who uses Nixle over there. So he's been in close contact with them, um, kind of, you know, kind of issues in general that have come up. At the end of the day, it really comes down to every agency uses Nixle slightly differently to try to meet the needs of their community. Um, so I think it's a fair question to say we should be as consistent as possible, but we also have to be cognizant of the needs of our individual, um, you know, community members that we're responsible for. Um, and as a note too, I, I'm really interested to hear about who received Nixles and who didn't. Um, when we get to that portion too, if you did not get one, if you could email me um, your phone number, I can go back and check with Nixle because there's, there's really two parts to the question. And the first is, um, if you didn't get a Nixle, I, I want to make sure that I find out so that way I can do my follow-up in my end Nixle. Um, and the second part of that is we didn't initially notify everybody because we were geotargeting, right? So we started kind of up on the mountain and as that evacuation order moved down, we started notifying more people. So it's a matter sometimes of timing of when you got an Ixl uh, versus not getting it at all. So I'd be curious to hear more from, um, from this group when appropriate from the chair. All right, um, thank you, Misty. And uh, Council Member Newhauser, is that, is that the extent of your comments right now? Is there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, thank you. I'm okay, good. yeah, thanks. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll just jump in and start the, um, 
the Nixel talk, if you want to call it that. Um, so I, I live in Glen Ellen on uh, Warm Springs Road, and there's a number of us um, on the Mac who live very close to each other, I'd say within a mile. There's probably four or five Mac members uh, of my house, and I'm right across from the Aaliyah Inn. And yeah, we, we got Nixels. Um, we felt well alerted. Uh, we did get some from Napa. Um, at least I think we did. It was it was a confusing night, of course, but I, I believe we got a few from Napa. But we we got um, you know more Nixels than we really wanted, <laughs> for sure. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention that's a little bit of a, a side thing, and it may not be a, a big issue, but I was just curious. Um, you know what we did? We started getting Nixels, and we decided well once. Once Kenwood gets a warning, then we're going to start packing. And then if Kenwood evacuates, then we'll start loading the car. And so, so, um, and I couldn't tell you the number of the evacuation zone, but on the other side of Warm Springs Road, uh, basically the north side from where we are, uh, they got an evacuation order um, probably in the wee hours of the morning. And on the other side of the road, we never even got, or, I'm sorry, they got a, yeah, they got an evacuation order. We never even got an actual warning on our side of the road, which was kind of odd to think that across the street, you know, there was an order and we didn't even have to evacuate. We, we did, but, um, and, I, and I totally recognize how complicated this whole thing is and I have total respect and humility for the job you guys are doing. And, and um, but I just thought I'd throw that out um, as something that seemed a little, a little bit off. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think um, like so much in life, especially when it comes to government, at some point you draw a line. Um, and so th this side does X and this side does Y. Um, so I, I don't know your specific situation off the top of my head, um, but I, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, and I, I know where Aaliyah in is, so I'll go back and take a look at the maps tomorrow and just wrap my head around it a little bit. Thanks. Yeah, I just thought if uh, it seemed like it would be a tiered thing, like you'd be under no, there'd be no warning and then a warning and then an evacuation order. So it seems like if you're next to an order, you'd expect a warning. But anyway, thanks thanks for following up on that. Yeah. Um, uh, Council Member Das? I think we've asked them to um, develop a scalpel instead of a machete. And when the scalpel really is a scalpel, it kind of makes it hard. In Kenwood, we're, help me here, Misty, I think we're 6A1 and A12 or something like that for Kenwood. Most of Kenwood did receive their Nixels. Mm -hmm. Where we got a flood of phone calls was when the Napa Nixels came in uh, because they confused people about, is this a different warning? Is this, because the first one from Nixel was about a warning. The one from Napa was get out. And it wasn't nearly as uh, clear and specific as the ones from Sonoma County. So while I think Sonoma County has greatly improved the mm -hmm. sort of bludgeon approach from Napa, uh, just sending it to everybody uh, confuses people about who are we talking about now? I'm not exactly sure where the line is for 6A12 or 6A2 between Kenwood and Glen Ellen, but uh, Chairman Dawson, you may live there. Well, I do. I live across the street from the line that the line goes down the middle of Warm Springs Road. But it was just just odd that one side yeah. was in order and the other one was it wasn't even a warning. That's my yeah. We yeah, just, I, I mean, you know, we all got to take care of ourselves. So we just made our decision and, and uh, it's not really a major complaint. It's just it seemed it seemed a little bit odd. So I don't I don't know if there's any tweaking that can be done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That. I'm sorry, who is that? Um, this is Melissa. Um, so Arthur, we're on uh, the southish end of Warm side of Warm Springs Road in 6A3. Mm -hmm. Across mm -hmm. the street from us is 6A2. 6A3 goes like all the way over to Shannon's house. Um, 6A, and then 6A2 goes up to, um, they, it, it is adjacent to Kenwood. So from uh -huh. the side of Warm Springs Road, it does go all the way up to Kenwood, which is then adjacent to the area that was in you know, truly in danger and was evacuated. So that's why we were the border and nothing, we never even got a warning. Because mm -hmm. because really the other side of Warm Springs Road wasn't in danger either, but again, they have to draw the line someplace. Right. Yeah, I wonder if maybe the lines, uh, this is a long, would be a long conversation, but maybe 
it, it seems odd that one side of a road would be evacuated and the other side wouldn't be, you know, just from a, from a, um, you know, if one side of the road's in danger, it feels like both sides would be in danger. But I think that's a longer conversation of how to, you know, how these lines might be differently drawn. But, they can you know, I, I, I guess I, I do have to say that I think the, the evacuations, yeah. um, there's been a lot of improvements since 2017. And it's, um, you know, I've been really happy to see just how well it's worked. So I, overall, I give, I give it really high marks. And, um, you know, like I said, it's not really a major complaint, just an observation. I think uh, Council Member Dickey has been trying to say something for a while. Okay, Council Member Dickey. Unrelated to Nixle. Um, I just I have some questions and I'm not certain if I'm asking them of Supervisor Gorin or Misty or Nancy. So forgive me if I don't know who to direct it to. But I'm curious about, I know the state has available um, very recently funds for wildfire mitigation. And I'm wondering if those funds are available for things like road widening. Um, you know, for evacuation purposes, maybe we're not putting in a third lane that's paved, but it's enough so that you can get people out in, in the event that, you know, you have a wildfire and you've got to evacuate large numbers of people very quickly. And then associated with that, I think most of us have realized looking at the maps of the fires that have taken place between 2017 and now, that the areas that burned in 2017 did not experience burning this time. It was the, it was the areas that had not burned that seemed to burn this time. And again, associated with these wildfire funds, the mitigation funds, do we, are we worried about there being fire in these areas that have burned now over the last three years as opposed to the areas that are more on the westerly side of, of Glen Ellen, you know, up towards the SDC, uh, Jack London State Park, and the area where I live. And, if, and so I'll just rest my question, you know, that we, we you know, we, we have these funds that are become available through the state can they be used for evacuation purposes and mitigation in that respect? And also, as we go forward and we're going to prepare for these fires using these funds, do we have to be concerned? Uh, obviously, erosion is a concern in the previously burned areas, but do they burn again? And what do they burn? And, and, and if we're going to use funds, do we prepare ourselves for the areas that have not been as severely burned? And anybody that can answer those questions, thank you. Um, all good questions. And I would recommend that you invite Cal Fire and your local fire agency, Sonoma Valley Fire, Kenwood Fire, to have a good discussion about um, all of the things that you just mentioned. Um, the county is, in, is starting to embark on what does vegetation management look like uh, and where would it be? And obviously, you know, the county is a very, very large place. And now we've had fires in the North County, certainly Santa Rosa area, uh, the East County twice, and the West County. Um, you should move to Petaluma, everybody. They don't seem to burn. And uh, the, the cows love it down there, a lot of fog. Um, so the um, good questions let's table the conversation about what does vegetation management look like and I hope the Sonoma Ecology Center can participate in that conversation because they are outreaching already uh, for potential funding to move forward on some of the um, projects and strategies that me we may want to develop a little prematurely uh, we're not quite ready for that obviously we started the conversation with a discussion with the pg e settlement funds. And although we allocated 25 million, um, that we'll need to look for a lot more funding for that. Permit Sonoma has applied for $50 million for vegetation management funds, not all in one year. No one can accommodate and spend all of that. 
But when I asked Cal Fire, I, I did, I was lucky enough to have a helicopter ride with Cal Fire this weekend, looking at the burn areas of Napa County and uh, Sonoma County. And so if anybody asks me the difference between Napa County and Sonoma County, I will say from the air, it's 10,000 square feet plus in a house. Uh, and the fact that they can afford their own firefighting force to, to save those houses, just joking. Those houses on those ridges are enormous. Um, uh, so Cal Fire has said, look at the direction that the fires have come from in the last three years. Primarily, they're coming from the north and the northeast, blasting over uh, the Mayakamas. And that is where you uh, uh, absolutely need to put your efforts on vegetation management, permanent fire breaks, coming up with all the strategies that you possibly can think of initially. Because I asked the same question, well, how about Sonoma Mountain and the uh, anomaly perhaps of the Sonoma Development Center or the, uh, the burning of the Developmental Center aside, that's not seems to be where the fires are originating. They're originating in the Mayakamas and the ember cast from Napa County, poor Napa County. Uh, Napa County is about a third burned. Sonoma County is about a third burned now. So we have some work cut out for us, but that's a good conversation to have when you bring all of the fire agencies together. Thank you, Supervisor Gorin. And I just wanna throw in, I've, I've done uh, quite a bit of work on fire history and uh, this, this situation goes back, you know, at least 140 years, similar conditions, winds, places burning, you know, every few years. Um, so I won't go into depth in it now, but there's, yeah, this, th th these patterns that we're seeing actually have been, they've been here for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll, yeah, I'm happy to, Matt, I'll send you a, a, cop, a summary of a study I did in, about Boobery if you're interested. Um, it shows all the fires that have happened up there. I am. I am interested. I mean, I think we all should be because, I mean, the pattern is clear at this point. And yeah. uh, how do you mitigate patterns? Well, first, first answer would be observe them, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and then act accordingly, you know, with information and funds and, and whatever else we can do. Because... I mean, we're looking at a situation that, that becomes increasingly untenable. I mean, how many of us have had to go out and get fire insurance lately and, and realize just the, the limitations to fire insurance access? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I heard a story about a fire, a fire, I think the fire chief for city of Santa Rosa had recently purchased a house and, uh, he purchased the house but couldn't get fire insurance, lost the house in the fire, and now, now he doesn't have anything, you know, except the goodwill of all of us, you know. Um, so I think, you know, these broader spectrum questions have very personal um, characteristics to them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Dickey. Um, any other comments? If I may, yeah, um, <clears throat> I just have a question. I'm curious about the apartments on the corner on Madrone Road and if there's any consideration giving extra timing when you're talking about when you're thinking about sending out alerts. I know that there's a lot of areas that are densely populated, but um, places where there's single family homes or, or even duplexes and things like that tend to have a little bit of a longer runway for people trying to evacuate. And, and that seems like a highly concentrated spot right there. So I'm wondering if there's any consideration given to that. Yeah, we, we do consider population in when we're giving alerts. We're, we're working closely with our fire partners first to understand where is the fire and what direction is it headed. And the second part of that, um, especially if there's a little bit of time to think and not just get everybody out of the way as quickly as possible, is how many people are in there, that area and how long will it take them to get out? It's obviously a much different scenario to say, okay, if we know we have, you know, roughly 50 homes in this area, that's a much bigger, you know, it's a much smaller impact than if we're looking at, you know, 500 residences in a particular area. So while we're not looking specifically at this apartment building or that apartment building, we're looking a little bit of a higher level scope of 
what is the population density in this area as we know it, because that will affect how long it takes for people to get it out. So hopefully that helps answer your question. Thank you, Misty. Um, I see a hand up from David uh, Gleba, uh, member of the public. David, would you like to speak? Uh, Arthur, you need to officially open public comment if you would like oh. to move to public comment. Oh, okay, um, so last chance for council members to comment. Do we want to, Arthur, this is Kate Eagles. Do we, I, two things, I, I, I second Vic, uh, council member um, Handron's comments and I'm thinking too that, that maybe we look at you know, um, any neighborhood groups that are, that are, have formed or might be uh, able to be formed around those apartment blocks. It's something to look into. So um, uh, just, just a note on that. And, and, um, and council member Dawson, chairman Dawson, excuse me, do you want to continue with the Nixle polling? Or are we going to, we're going to table that for now in the oh, interest of time? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the reminder. Yeah. So let's, let's continue with the Nixle polling. I think it's, it's valuable for uh, the county representatives who are here to, to find out. And then we, we'll get okay. open public comments and in, in as soon as we can. Um, okay, so, I'll, go quick, I'll go quickly on that if you want, okay. Arthur, if you want me in. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, go okay. ahead. Council so, member Eagles, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so yes, I got both Napa and Sonoma. Uh, just a couple notes on that, though. I am, I am in a 95476 Sonoma zip code, so it makes sense that I get both. And I find both actually quite useful. And I, I think the initial cap of the, the initial cap spelling out of the county when they come through is helpful, uh, but I do find that, that the Napa alerts give me some context as to where the fire might be spreading, where it might be joining, and so I, I appreciate both, actually. I do get both, um, uh, and I did get both the other day or the other week. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Council Member Eagles, and um, let's see. Council Member Cooper? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I got the Sonoma Nixle, just FYI. Adobe Canyon Road, about a quarter of a mile off Highway 12. I just wanted to, why we have Misty, I just want to add one more thing about communication. Uh, I stayed, so I had a bit of time to talk with sheriffs and the CHP that were at the, uh, at the, the beginning of Adobe Canyon Road. The thing that they both said to me that, that struck me um, was the CHP didn't know exactly, you talk about which routes to, to go to get out. He told me that they, they met the Safeway parking lot at Calistoga Road, but it was fairly fuzzy to, to them because they usually came in from different parts of the state. And they did know our area. <clears throat> they were pretty fuzzy about where to go if we needed to go out. And the sheriff that came to my house to tell me to leave, it didn't seem like they were talking to each other at all. But that's not a criticism because they were all great, really good. And appreciated, but the, just that's just feedback. They they didn't seem to be communicating at all. And the CHP, three of them from different areas that I talked to, came back from Safeway, pretty fuzzy about where to tell people to go and how to handle movement. I just wanted to let you know that. Oh, all right, thank you, thank you, Councilmember Cooper. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think we've we've heard from Councilmember Das. If, if you haven't given your next Nixle report, let me know. Councilmember Newhauser, I think we heard from you. Uh, Councilmember Handron, Cooper, and um, Councilmember um, Dickey, and Councilmember Dowling. I don't think we. I uh, my Nixle stuff was fine. I did receive the NAP as well as Sonoma County. I agree with uh, with Kate that it was useful to know. You just have to read them you know, and discern kind of what it is that they're intending. All right, thank you, Council Chair, Member Dickey. Chair Dawson. Yeah. Mark Newhauser here. Um, I uh, did not comment on what I received. Um, my wife did not receive the Nixle notices from Sonoma County, but I did. And I appreciated the fact that not only did they send the um, area code number, but then it was followed up with a, a verbal description of that area in a second Nixel notice. At first, it was a little disconcerting that we got you know, two in a row, um, but the fact that so many people were unaware of what area code applied to them 
um, it, it was helpful to have that description follow. And, and I think that maybe as a part of the preparedness pack, um, that information, um, people can be directed to print out a map and so they can see not only the adjacent areas, but also to know precisely what area they live in. So when those notifications come, there's not a panic or a rush to uh, next door asking people, what area do I live in? <laughs> you know, which happened. A lot of people just did not know. So anyway, yeah. And also, and Misty, if, if, if uh, maybe Arthur, uh, if um, uh, or someone can send out Misty's email uh, address afterwards so we can send her the phone numbers of people who did not get alerts, that would be very helpful. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Council Member Newhouser. And any other um, council members who would like to comment on their Nixle experience? I think uh, Council Member Hambron is raising her hand. Yes. Okay. So I, I just re I received all the Nixle alerts and uh, also the emergency alerts from the county, which I think were different. And then also the Napa, I did receive some of the Napa Nixle alerts. And, and again, I found them helpful as well. I'll read and pay attention and they worked. All right, thank you, Council Member Handron. And I'm just gonna throw in that, that the Nixles were good and that it also was using uh, some of the online maps, particularly the one that shows the hotspots. Mm -hmm. You could really see where the fire was going and that, that helped. Yeah. Um, as well. So it's it kind of a combination of information sources that worked for me at least. Um, oh, and I, think, uh, I think uh, the council member Dowling also has something to say. Okay. Yeah. This council member Dowling? A good um, follow up to what Chair Dawson just pointed out. So one or the other of our phones were going off on Nixle all night. So I think that's a great thing. Um, the only uh, Nixle alert that we got that was a little bit disturbing was one that was, I believe, for Napa. And it, it, it just said, get out now. And um, if we were less experienced, which I wish that we were, um, in, in fires and evacuation, then we probably would have been in sheer panic. But we were able to look at the maps and say, OK, that makes absolutely no sense and our area is not under even a warning right now, across the street is, but so we ignored that, but I think that that may be something to target and fix that perhaps phrasing a Nixle with no other words besides get out now, um, maybe can be something easy to address. All right. Yeah, th thank, you. thank you for that comment too. All right, I think uh, I would like to open it up to public comments. And so I'll recognize uh, David Gleba, who's been very patient, waiting to comment. This is, uh, I guess, Ariel. The unmute queue there. Thanks very much. Um, I live up on uh, Cave Dale Road, so we're technically part of Glen Ellen, but we may be outside of your advisory boundary. Um, but it comes to, I saw you were talking about evacuation. That's something that's obviously um, pretty near and dear to our hearts, given the remoteness of the area and the, and the quality of our road. Um, real quick, just a, a quick Nixle census edition. Uh, up at Cave Dale, I got all the Nixle alerts. My partner got none of them. And he had already registered. Um, and we tried to go online and try to figure out if he could somehow sort of reset. But once it had your phone number in the system, and he may have forgotten his password or something, it seemed like there was no way to sort of just reset it to sign you up again. Um, and obviously you could use the web browser to go look at what the Nixle alerts are, but you wouldn't get the benefit of having them pushed to you when something changes. So uh, that's just somewhat similar to council member Newhouser. One member of the household got them and another member didn't. So for what that's worth. Um, and then, um, and then Misty, I'll assume your uh, email is probably misty.wood at sonoma-county.org. If it's not, please, Maybe say so. Um, and then I also just had three questions. Um, first is back in August of last year, there was an evacuation drill. I think the first the county did for the Cave Dale Trinity area. And I was curious um, what was learned from that or if there were any insights from that. I think they were gonna do one up at Fitch Mountain Road in Healdsburg as well. And so I was curious what that was, uh, what, what learnings came out of that. Um, I'm just curious where the codes and how they got derived with these intuitive names like 6F1, where we are. Um, I've had lots of people ask me and I don't have a good answer. So just that's a curiosity question. Um, second, um, 
I was going to say the, um, it, you mentioned, I think, the evacuation ribbons, and I saw those on the TV coverage of Napa. And so I was really curious, does that mean basically something you put somewhere on your household so that the sheriff knows that you've already gone and they don't waste time coming to knock on your door? Um, because if that's the case, especially on a road like Cavedale, you know, a lot of the homes are way off the road. And so we could save the sheriff a lot of time. And during that evacuation drill in 2019, I know we didn't hear the high-low siren um, from the house because it's a, a, it's a decent distance down an easement road from the road. Um, so that's just... Uh, that's the second question about evacuation ribbons. And then the third thing I just thought was, um, if you're trying to get the word out about the evacuation packs, I mean, I think we all probably know we're on next door. And I know we see public safety mes messages from the county on that channel. And so if there were an announcement about, you know, there's this place in the community, you could pick these up where they're available. I think that would probably be a really good way to get the word out to a broader audience. Um, that, that could be useful. And then, um, so those are my questions. And then lastly, I'd just like to comment and thank you to the staff of the county. Um, the fact that Nancy isn't in New Zealand where she could be led by Jacinda Ardern and there's no COVID is remarkable, so thank you. And the fact that Mitzi didn't get scared away after um, coming right into fires when she hit the Sheriff's Department is remarkable too. And I think also Johannes Hurwitz who runs the Roads Department, his first day on the job was apparently the, the day of the Tubbs fire. So. Um, you're really troopers and we really do appreciate your work in the community, including staying here tonight for this, this conversation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, David. Any other uh, community members that would like to comment? Okay. Um, I think, let's see, if there are any, any last uh, responses from the presenters, this would be the opportunity. So, Mr. I can respond to Mr. Gleba's uh, questions if you'd like, Chair Dawson. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. All right, um, so yes, my email address is, as you, um, as you uh, described, a standard county email address. Uh, when it comes to the Nixle settings, um, you know, I, it might just be best for your partner to unsubscribe to the text messages and immediately go to nixle.com and start, a, you know, sort of restart a new account if, if they're having trouble um, sort of access in the account. Obviously, getting those those push notifications, getting those text, I'm sorry, those text notifications is really key. Um, and they can adjust, you know, different zip codes, different locations, and really fine tune it so that it really works well for the both of you. Um, on the codes, <laughs> on the evacuation zones. So we were looking at what is the easiest and most logical way to break the 1,500 square miles or so um, into, into something that's easy to sort of grasp. Um, so kind of the way we, we came up with it is that first number represents our patrol zones. So all of you in the Sonoma Valley are in patrol zone six, which is why all evacuation zone that starts with six. When we looked at zone six, we broke it down into those smaller subsections of A or F, um, or you know, F2, D1, that sort of thing. Um, as a way to logically on our end um, sort of know where those zones are and break it sim down simply and also keep the numbers and letters as short as possible so it's as easy to remember as possible. We didn't want something, you know, we didn't want 15 different letters and numbers. So we tried to um, succinctly uh, label those zones as well as we could considering the geographic area that we're working with. Um, and then getting down to the evacuation ribbons that Nancy had mentioned. Um, yes, you're exactly right. That, the purpose of the ribbons is to place those ribbons on your, um, you know, on your gate or on your house when you evacuate, if it's safe and you have time to do so, so that peace officers coming through the neighborhood already know that you're aware of the evacuation and it's what, sort of one less door that we have to knock on. So we are happy to do it. it it's what we do. Um, but you're right, it does save us time in the field to know that you're already safe. So um, that concludes my responses. All right, thank you, Misty. And uh, Nancy, do you have anything you'd want to add to that? or? Um, only that I, I agree next door would probably be a, um, a good place to broadcast the availability. There's some logistical pieces in there that I have to figure out, but thank you very much for that idea. All right, thanks, Nancy. Um, okay, I think we can move on to our next agenda item. Uh, mission statement and goals and priorities. And I'm gonna suggest since it's already 
um, coming up on two hours that maybe we just um, uh, sort of look things over a little bit, but, but um, you know, be, just take tonight as a time to begin thinking about this and, and uh, not have a goal of coming to a conclusion. Unless we all agree one of the existing ones would, would serve us, we could, we could do that. Um, so um, let's see, we've got maybe, um, Ariel, are, are you able to put up that, um, the sheet with the mission statements that you put out uh, earlier today? Yes, I was just trying to figure out how to very nicely boot Nancy and Misty out because they are dismissed. Ah. So if you guys want to just log off, um, Nancy and Misty, feel free to do so. <laughs> thank you so and, much. And thank you both. That was great. Really, really great information and, and um, appreciate your all your service to the community. Give me one second. All right, so can everyone see that? I, I have just the mission statements up um, and then we can, if, if that's how you'd like to do it, Chair Dawson, and then we can move to the grows and priorities. Um, I just wanna make it readable. Yeah, I can read it um, and I have a pretty small screen. Uh, this is Council Member Eagle's clarifying question. Ariel, is this the October 14th document that you're um, showing? That's what shows on my Okay, the most recent ones as sent today. Just checking on the on the on the version. Yeah, I believe that's or was right. It yesterday. Okay, thank you. So, um, how about if I I'll read through these and um, you know why don't I read each one and and people can just comment on things they like or don't like about each one of these three statements and then that might give us a way to to move forward. Um, so I'll start with the Springs Mac mission statement. The Springs Municipal Advisory Council represents the people of the Springs and Sonoma Valley as the voice of the community to elected representatives. SMAC is committed to engage with all community members in meaningful and inclusive ways to promote the health and well being of the Springs. So, any, any thoughts or comments on, uh, you know, maybe just imagine if we were to adopt that, uh, what would we, would we change it or is it, is, would it work as it stands? What's missing? Yeah, council member uh, Handron. So I really like the simplicity of, of the Springs Mac. I like how it's, it's short and concise and real plain language. But I think that our focus is a little bit different or a little broader maybe. Um, so maybe changing it up a bit, but I, I really, I would prefer to have something short and very concise and plain language, kind of something that's really accessible to many different people. So if somebody reads it, they know exactly who we are and what we do in a plain yeah. way. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Thank you, Councilmember Handron, and I, I generally agree with that idea. Yeah. Um, any other comments on that on that Springs Mac Commission statement? It looks like uh, Council Member Newhouser has a comment. All right, Council Member Newhouser. I'm, I'm physically raising my hand, but <laughs> I think we've lost our op option to uh, electronically raise our hand. Anyway, um, I sent some comments earlier via email, and, and then I think I got scolded a little bit for, I don't know if it was a breach of the Brown Act, but when I saw the email, when I go into editing mode, I go into typing. And, um, and I, I think that this is really difficult to pen a mission statement verbally uh, or by committee unless we do it in writing. So anyway, it's just a little bit of a challenge and I think there's something that um, I think that we can refine um, in writing and not necessarily conclude tonight. But I do want to concur with Councilwoman uh, Kahendran uh, in that I really like the simplicity of the, the springs, right? And I, and I said so in my response to uh, Chair Dawson. Um, and I wrote up something separate 
if we want something more specific that actually defines more precisely who we are, but I don't know if that's necessary in a mission statement. So I'll leave it stand at that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Councilmember Newhouser. Any other comments on that uh, Springs mission statement? No, no, uh, Chairman Dawson. But can I ask a clarifying qu question based on th th those comments? This is Councilman Councilmember Eagles. So, do the mission statements necessarily go with a goals and priorities um, statement? Because in that case, you know, one could be much more simple, and one could expand on on some other priorities. Is that necessarily how this will happen? Is is there a perspective on that? Um, well, I've never done this before, but I, I mean, it seems to me that the that the goals and priorities should you know, should grow out of the mission statement. So there should be a, an obvious connection. And, and I certainly, agree that, certainly, yeah. That, yeah, and I agree that I think the goals and priorities can be much more um, specific and detailed. And the mission statement should be a, uh, like Council Member Handrum was saying, should be uh, very easy to understand, you know, straightforward language. Um, and then, you know, if, if we get into more details, we can do that with the, um, with the goals and priorities. Um, so I'd, yeah, I'd be inclined to, to keep this, this mission statement as general as, not general, but as uh, yeah, plain and straightforward as possible and then get into the nitty gritty with, the, um, with our goals and priorities. Uh, Great, I thank wanna, you. I wanna add a, a clarifying, um, so I know when the Springs Mac uh, did this work, um, they actually kind of, to Council Member Newhouser's point, they ended up um, appointing an ad hoc um, to kind of be able to work in that way in writing and to be able to kind of hash it out. And they came back to the group um, at the next meeting or probably maybe two meetings from then. Um, and then they kind of workshopped it. So that's an option um, if you guys would want to pursue that and if the chair wants to pursue that. Um, where you could appoint an ad hoc to really like edit it down of folks that were interested in that and they could bring back some options to the group. But no, we can't have people e emailing each other, um, workshopping. I know that's a really natural way to do it, but that is a Brown Act violation. <laughs> so I'd, I'd, uh, I'd suggest maybe the, and I, I like, I like the, that idea, um, Ariel, I, and I think it makes a lot of sense to have an ad hoc committee. I think, um, I'd be inclined to, to go through these three um, mission statements just to get the feedback from the whole group and then form an ad hoc committee to um, you know, write up a draft mission statement that we can present at the next uh, MAC meeting. And I think that might speed up the process a little bit if we, if we sort of get initial feedback from everybody and then, and then go into writing it. Um, if I may amend that motion. Or do you want to make, you want to have a, I do I need to make that a, I'm not sure is that, do I need to make that a, uh, do I need to make a motion on, on that or uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I will if I need to. <laughs> I, I think that we should just proceed with, um, so this, now you're getting into some really specific Brown Act stuff that I'm not sure about. I'm so sorry. So I, I would say just, why don't you do what you just suggested Chair Dawson and read the three and kind of see people's just what they, what they, uh, if you want to get the feedback from the group. Um, and then I think you can appoint an ad hoc tonight, um, even though it wasn't agendized. If I'm saying that, um, if that's wrong, then, you know, I get scolded, not you guys. So okay. um, I will put myself out there that way. That is fine. Okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead and read, uh, we'll go to the next one, the lower Russian River Mac, or actually it's, I think a number of Macs must have this mission statement and they've, so, um, that's why it has the MAC name in, in, um, in brackets. So the MAC is established to advise the Board of Supervisors and other county decision makers on local planning and management decisions relating to the name of the region, whatever that is, uh, to provide a regular forum for citizen part participation in the formation of advisory recommendations on those decisions and to provide a bridge for communication between the county and local residents and businesses and the general public on local government decisions affecting the MAC area. That, I'll just say that is a mouthful. <laughs> 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 um, that's my comment. Yes, it it's, uh, feels convoluted. Uh, 
Uh, any other any other comments or um, thoughts on that one? This is Jed uh, Cooper. I, I would just say, maybe I, just a feeling. Maybe we all kind of feel the the thoughts that have been expressed in terms of making this simple, uh, short. It seems like we could almost jump to that and send you things differently. Uh huh. And, and and do the ad hoc committee. That's just my my input. As, as we read these. They're all kind of similar and probably a little too long for what we all probably want. Anyway. Yeah, I think, thank you, Council Member Cooper. Um, just trying to think of the most efficient way to do this. I mean, do we want to, how about I'll, I'll go ahead and read the last one, which was, was just a draft mission statement that was done under the, the forum uh, as we were starting to talk about a MAC committee. And then um, maybe if, if people want to just comment on on anything that they feel needs to go into the mission statement that's not in the spring's mission statement uh, any, that might might be in these other two or maybe something else. So um, the North Valley Municipal Advisory Council acts as a bridge between the residents, businesses, property owners, and workers, the community of Northern Sonoma Valley and county government. Working in collaboration with local organizations and within the purview of its advisory topics, the North Valley Municipal Advisory Council will solicit community input and opinion, identify its priorities, needs, and desires, and inform and advise the county on these matters. So I'll say you and I probably wrote some of that. It's a bit of a mouthful as well. Uh, it's a little more specific than the Springs MAC statement. Um, any, the comment? any comments? Yeah, Council Member Dickey. Um, I think much of what in the latter part of that, the, the GE forum MAC committee statement um, could be represented in goals and priorities. Uh -huh. um, and I, the only thing I would say that we could add to the Springs uh, mission statement is our, the geography of it, a geographic description of where, of, you know, where we are, you know, and who we're representing. Um, but I think this, this, you know, the, the mission statement from the GE Mac, I think much of that could be represented in a priorities and goals example, um, and make it simple, you know, uh -huh. that's my input. And I can right. my statement. <laughs> um, if, I, if I could, I'm, and, and this is not a, what your goals and priorities have to look like at all, but I'm just going to scroll to the lower half of this document that does show how the Springs MAC, you know, complemented their very broad mission statement with their pretty specific goals. And again, this isn't what yours has to look like, but it just might help the conversation a little bit. Yeah, this is this is Council Member Eagle. So I'm sorry if I'm interrupting folks. I can't see anyone's okay. hands. I apologize. Yeah. But you know, I, I like this third one in the sense that it 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 specifies advisory topics and it gives a little bit more detail about who's who's whose voices we're listening to. But I think to 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 um um to Council Member Dickey's point, if we do that in the goals and priorities, then, then I think it's not necessary in the mission statement. So I basically am saying the same thing, but I just wanted to, to say that I think it, it's important to, to reiterate who we're talking to and that the purview of the advisory topics really, um, you know, uh, set, set the things that we can look at. And I think that's important to, to state. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Council Member Eagles. Uh, excuse me, Chair Dawson. Yeah, Mark Council Member um, Yeah, I sent you something that kind of addresses the um, um, uh, Councilwoman uh, Eagle's comments. Um, that was a just suggested language that does address our specific area, as in Chair Dickey mentioned, as well as our um, our assigned area or um, subjects of purview. And I don't know if you can make that available if you got that email or not, but um, 
But again, I, I, I just wanted to reiterate that I, I like the simplicity um, and partly for the reason it gives us the opportunity to not only interpret that, um, but also to evolve if our mission does expand, which we hope it will in the future. Um, so I, I, again, the only amendment I was going to suggest to your motion was to not only to develop a more precise mission statement, but to also have the goals um, and purpose um, developed as well to present to the overall group if you were to form a, an ad hoc committee. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Newhauser. Um, I, I, I do feel that, um, you know, the goals and I, I feel like it would be relatively straightforward for an ad hoc committee to come up with a mission statement. I think it would be uh, more difficult without a, um, without having a, a longer, probably a longer discussion than we can have tonight to, for an ad hoc committee to develop the goals and priorities. Um, so I don't know if we want to split that into two things where the ad hoc committee starts with a mission. And then once we agree on a mission, then we, then we move on to the goals and priorities. Um, any, any thoughts on, on that process? Anyone? I'd go to do what you just said and start, start with a mission statement and bounce off that to the goals and priorities. That's a good idea. I, I agree as well. And I, I think that a um, goals and priorities needs to be an entire meeting agenda. I don't think that it's something that we can, we can tack on with, with other items. Any other comments? I just want to clarify. Um, I, I'm sorry, it's really hard to scroll up and down when I'm sharing my screen. I don't know if that was Councilmember Dowling who just suggested um, having a whole meeting for the goals and priorities. Are you saying kind of not have any other agenda items, just the goals and priorities? I just want to be clear for the chair, because yeah. then we work to develop the... Um, Correct, that's, that's what I'm suggesting. I just think okay. it's very important as we're setting the foundation for our council that you know we can all do it with fresh eyes at the beginning of the meeting and um, focus on it. And if it ends up being a short meeting, great. But that I should, agree with that. That should probably be our only agenda item. Does anyone mind if I stop sharing my screen so I can see people better? No, no problem. Okay. Any other comments? So I'll, I'll check in with Ariel. Can I, um, can I make a motion to form an ad hoc committee to uh, draft a mission statement? based on you, well, you, so uh, a few things and um if anything i say here it turns out later to be wrong my apologies but i think i have a decent enough sense of it um you as chair can't really make motions but oh, okay. you're, you have to have someone else make the motion um and second but you're free to discuss um so your ad hoc has to be less than a quorum so it can be right. three people so if you, of the folks who are here tonight, if they want to um, either, however you want to do that, if you want to nominate people, if you want to ask for volunteers, um, once you get that worked out, you can um, ask for a motion to form the subcommittee and a second and a vote. So you're saying ask, ask for volunteers first and then, and then ask for a motion? Yeah, I mean, I think we should know who's on the subcommittee before people vote for it, right? Yeah, I suppose, yeah. Um, okay, so I, uh, so three people, um, I mean, I feel like I should be on it just since I'm chair and, and um, uh, so who would be interested in, in volunteering to serve on an ad hoc mission statement committee with me? I'd be willing. Okay, Council Member Newhauser. I, I, I would too. Chair Dawson, if if uh, you need another person, this is uh, Chair. I mean, this is not Chair. This is Council Member Eagles. Okay, thanks, Council Member Eagles. So, um, and I, I don't know how important it is to have um, someone from Kenwood on the on this committee. Um, if uh, Council Member Doss or Council Member Cooper uh, feels strongly about that, then then uh, 
you know, certainly we can, we can make sure one of the uh, committee members, ad hoc committee members is from Kenwood. Looks uh, like uh, Vice Chair Doss dropped off as well. Sorry? Uh, it looks like uh, Vice Chair Doss dropped off unless somehow I can't see him. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, I this is Jed Cooper. I, I'm an alternative, so I don't, I'm happy to do anything, but I don't, I'm an alternative. So I think, does it need to be a council member? I think alternates can serve on ad hocs just like regular members. It's just about voting. Um, that's the issue. So, so if you would like to, or if, if um, that's, that's up to the chair and the body, if you want um, to make sure there's a representative from Kenwood or not or whatever, that's, that's all up to you guys. Um, alternates can serve on, on subcommittees though. Well, I'm the only one from Kenwood here and happy, <laughs> happy to do it. Okay, so we have three, three volunteers. Um, so let's see, how do we, how shall we choose? We have a, anybody got a coin to flip? No, I have. A, I move. I'll make a motion. Okay. I move. I I mo. I make the. Uh, what's the proper proper language, Ariel? Um. Say I I move that the. Uh, that we form a subcommittee to discuss the mission statement made up of these people and say their names. Very good. I move that we form an ad hoc committee to review the possibility of mission statement development uh, consisting of uh, Chairman Arthur Dawson, uh, council, council member Kate Eagles, alternative Jed Cooper and uh, council member Mark Newhauser. Uh, so actually that's too many. It has to be three. You can't Good. have four. So someone has to step back. I think, right? You're you're on another brown acted committee, council member Dick. <laughs> <laughs> well, so a quorum is if we have nine members, a quorum would be a majority, correct? Yes. Yeah, so, well, I think so. that alternates don't count towards a quorum. Okay. Right, because they're so, alternate. So it's seven voting members. He could qualify. Uh, he could participate on the ad hoc committee, but he would not necessarily be in violation of the Brown Act because he's not a voting member of the committee. Oh, uh, you're getting. I'm. I must have committee so. to, to three, um, because that okay. is what I think. And we don't have Pat Gillardi here, who is my Brown Act expert. Yeah. And so. <laughs> I will step back. I can, I can, uh, I can step down too. Can. <laughs> no, let me. Yeah. I'll step down. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's good to have uh, Kenwood in the mix. So, um, so I've already submitted my thoughts on this, and um, I would be um, honored to have uh, Chair Dawson and Council Members uh, Cooper and Eagles to serve on this subcommittee. All right, thank you, Council Member Newhauser. And, um, and that feels nicely geographically separated. We're, we're the either end of the Mac and then the middle as far as geographically. There you go. Okay, so um, since you're new at this, Arthur, there's a, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second. Is there a second? A second motion? Uh, it's Council Member Hanter is seconding the motion to form an ad hoc committee. So, um, so all in favor of forming an ad hoc committee with council members uh, Eagles, Cooper, and Dawson, um, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion passes, um, I think unanimously, at least there were no, there were no, no nays, so. Um, wait, let me, so, let's, let, wait, let me clarify this. So it's, uh, um, so both, Council Member Cooper and Dowling are allowed to vote because um, Angela or Council Member Nardo Morgan and Council Member or Vice Chair Doss are not present. So uh -huh. that okay, would be, I vote yes. Okay. <laughs> so, but that would be a, and I'm trying to help out our minute taker too. Um, <laughs> yes. Dowling, Dowling votes yes. So, but that would be a, I'm trying to count it out. Sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, zero, two vote because there's two absent. So seven in favor, zero no's, and two absent. So the resolution, the motion passes and we will form an ad hoc committee and I will uh, get in touch with the other committee members in the next uh, week or so and we'll start um, passing around ideas for, uh, for, we'll start drafting a mission statement. And then, um, and I believe it sounded like there was pretty good agreement on um, waiting to develop the goals and priorities until after the mission statement is, is set. Does anybody uh seriously against that or i think we should do it concurrently <laughs> I mean, um why why belabor it that could that could be one meeting finalize mission statement do our goals and then yeah oh well now i'm talking about i'm talking about um oh i see what you're saying so we so we would draft the mission statement bring it back to the full full council Hopefully that that passes muster. We pass that, and then we go into yeah. I, I agree with that. Yeah. No, I'm you're mis you're mis um, interpreting what I said. I think you should do the goals and priorities and the mission statement simultaneously. Present it to us, and then if we have a disagreement about it, then we can re-examine. But in the meantime, we'll have you know we'll have made some progress. Hello. Hello. We're here. Is this? Hi, this is Angela Nardo Morgan. Oh, Angela, hi. <laughs> hey, hi. I've been at the whole meeting, but I couldn't speak because something was wrong with my microphone. So I just wanted to let you know I've been at the entire meeting, and if you need me to vote, I'm happy. To, uh, my husband called on his line and was able to get in as a participant, and I apologize for not being uh, able to speak. But I'm here if you need a vote. I think I think we're good, but thanks, um, Councilmember. Okay, great. Uh, Narda Morgan for for staying with us. Um, yeah, that's great. So, um, sure, awesome. as far as I so uh, what Councilmember Dickey was saying was that we should just go ahead and draft some goals and priorities. Um, I mean, I could do that. I just feel like uh, I mean we could do that as a as a threesome as a committee ad hoc committee. Uh, but I feel like it would there might be a lot of ideas that we would be missing, and then it would um well we, I mean, could, we could discuss them then you know but in the meantime i'm trying to be efficient about everybody's time I yeah mean, there's going to be other things that we're going to want to discuss and um anyway can we communicate it can the three of us communicate to the others before the next meeting is that legal under the brown act i mean can yeah, we so that's the idea of ad hoc committees, right? Because it's a Brown Act violation to have folks communicating out of the public okay. view because it's about public noticing. So the public needs to know what you're doing so that they can participate since it's a public body. So the okay. ad hoc allows you guys to kind of craft something behind the scenes and bring it before the full body when it's noticed. Um, so that's really up to you guys if, if um, there's a majority support for having the ad hoc take a crack at goals and priorities or whether you'd rather have that be um, completely developed in kind of the public meeting. But there would always be room for the full body to say, I don't like that in your mission statement. I think this should be a goal, whatever. Like it's always gonna be decided on in public, if that makes yeah. sense. So can, can Chair Dawson ask for a, a motion on yeah, that? Yeah, would, would uh, someone like to, to uh, uh, how do you say it? Raise a motion to to for the ad hoc committee to also write draft uh, goals and priorities. Well, I move that we invite the ad hoc committee that we just appointed to draft a mission statement um, to pre present to the group to also um, draft our goals and priorities as well for feedback from the group at a future meeting. And do we have a second? I second it. All right. So all in favor, uh, raise, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Right. aye. I'll give it a crack. You know, any, what's our, what's the, and all, all uh, against? 
And Erna, what's our count? Oh, since Angela joins, um, only Judd or <laughs> Melissa counts. Or, sorry, counts alternate Cooper or, or uh, alternate Dowling. They both voted the same, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so then we have a, um, what, a six zero one vote, with the one being Vice Chair Doss, who is absent. Okay, so the resolution passes, and the ad hoc committee will also draft the uh, um, goals and priorities along with the mission statement. Also, what I just said might be wrong, and I will work with the minute taker and the recording to make sure that that is correct, because it's okay. been a long two weeks, everybody. It has been, yep. Yeah. All right, I think we can now move on to reports and announcements. And remember, this is not required if you feel like uh, we've got um, Council Member Dickey and Council Member Dowling uh, sort of a standard slot if you want to make a report, but you don't have to. So come back and get me. I'm happy to stand here. So, Council Member Dickey, uh, do you have anything to report about the Citizens Advisory Council? Um, our next CAC meeting is at the end of this month. We did not have one last month. Um, next month's meeting is, uh, will include a presentation on urban growth boundaries and um, on evacuation preparedness. And those are the two items that are on our agenda. All right, thank you, Council Member Dickey. And, um, is it, I think I get notices, but is it possible for you to, or for the MAC to send out to all the MAC members, just let us know when, when exactly that's happening? Um, you mean have, have you guys received my, the agenda that came to me today? Um, yeah, I wonder if, if we, um, yeah, that's a public notice. You can receive yeah. it. You can, okay. you can sign up for it, Arthur. Or just sign up for it. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just recommend people sign up for it if they want to get that. Yeah, and, and um, difficulties with that, I can be sure and forward it to everybody in the group. Okay. I, I don't have enough emails in my inbox, so I'm gonna, definitely going to do it. <laughs> 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 and uh, <laughs> Council Member Dowling, uh, would you like to give a report on the Glen Ellen Forum? Very, very briefly. Um, in our last meeting, we had presenta a presentation from a group of the, the Bennett Valley Association about um, some proposed improvements to North Sonoma Valley no, North Sonoma Mountain Regional Park. And um, certainly the neighbors are very passionate about that. There is additional information available on the county website, the Glen Ellen Forum website. And there was also a thorough write-up of that um, presentation in the Kenwood Press that'll be in your mailbox on the 15th. And um, the other items discussed were uh, from Steve Lee about um, the precarious situation of the Sonoma Creek in that the water levels are extremely low and encouraging anyone who is um, drawing water from the creek, whether legally or illegally, that they um, please limit that activity um, because it is causing um, some irreparable hardship to, to the repairing quarter in the, the creek. Um, and there was also a little discussion about emergency preparedness as well. All right. Thank you, Council Member Dowling. Um, okay. Does uh, let's see. Does anyone, any member of the public, um, wish to speak on matters? Um, not quite clear what this is, but um, I think any any matters, any I guess any reports or announcement from the public is basically what. A, if any member of the public would like to announce or report on anything. I'm not, okay. I'm not seeing anything. Okay, yeah. Okay, so now um, it's uh, consideration of items for future agenda. And um, so I'm just going to throw out what I've heard so far tonight is, is that uh, at the next meeting, we want to uh, review the draft mission statement and review the goals and priorities and s probably spend a lot of the meeting on that, those items. Um, does anyone have anything else that they feel should be on the agenda next time? I do have a question, a clarifying question uh, regarding yeah. the, uh, the subcommittee. Can we send, uh, can other members send comments to the committee without violating the Brown Act? 
Good question. Thanks, Councilmember Newhazer. Mario, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, I am going to check on that and I will let you all know tomorrow. I just don't, I know no one's trying to do anything nefarious or anything. I just really want to make sure that we're consistent with the Brown Act. And so um, I'll make a note of that and I will uh, send a, a message to the whole group about specifically those kinds of things. Um, and, and whether that's, I think it's okay to have the one-way feedback, but I'm not 100% sure. So um, I will check and clarify that tomorrow. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks for being careful on that. Yeah. So based um, on training, if I may add, um, a one-way communication, or at least between one person and another person, as long as it's not repeated to other people, it doesn't uh, uh, meet the definition of a serial meeting which was a no-no. Yes, right. That's, that's, um, that's true. So I, I think it would be okay. I mean, it's, you know, especially since it's not really a meeting, you're just basically sending information. Because there is a good example that's on that same page that you distributed of the goals and priorities. And it would be pretty easy for people to comment on that and just send it to the ad hoc committee. And then it would help the group to formulate a solid draft that we could quickly approve without going three hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I, I think you're right, council member. I just, I, it, like I said, it's been a long, it's, it's been a long couple weeks and I'm feeling a little set adrift right now. So I'm going to check and I will okay. let you guys know tomorrow. But I, 99% I, you're totally right. I just, I don't want to say something incorrect. Thanks. Thanks, Ariel. Thank and I, I mean, I share this, this, the sentiments of Councilmember Newhouser, and I also want to be careful. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for being careful and checking. So any, anything else we want to put on the agenda for next month? Well, uh, if not, uh, do we need, we don't need to do a motion for the proposed agenda, do we? No, no, that's okay. just receive. And it doesn't even have to be planning for the next agenda, right? It can just be topics. Kind of mm -hmm. like last time, like topics you guys would like to hear, but it sounds like we're pretty focused on the uh, goals and priorities and mission statement and getting that out of the way. So um, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Then I'm gonna request uh, that someone make a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Anybody second that motion? I can second. This is Eagles. All right. Thanks, Councilmember Eagles. So all those in favor, say aye. 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 And all those opposed, say nay or silence. <laughs> all right. I think, uh, well, I can't see, but in my blind stay here, I think we passed that, but Ariel can confirm that. Yep, you're, you're all good. You're all good to adjourn. <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm officially adjourning this meeting at 7.55 p.m. on October 14th, 2020. Good night. <laughs> Everyone stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Good night, all. Thank Thanks you.